So we can record it. I can do a Zoom meeting live and I can videotape the whole thing. Oh. So that way, like, I can just post that onto YouTube after we finish. Um, but yeah, I think we should be good. We should be able to videotape it. So. Good, good. Oops. Sorry, guys. I'm having trouble. My mouse has once again disappeared. Little mouse, where'd you go? Um, how long is like the field day? So I'm guessing like an hour. Probably yeah. around an hour. It, it could be if everybody's bored. It could be ten minutes. <laughs> it's just gonna. I'm just gonna set up some equipment and we'll look at some fake hives and basically talk about what you know whatever questions people have. Um, it's not really a, a a prepared presentation or anything. Awesome. Also, if anybody needs a ride or wants to park, we'll have a car if there's more people in there. So just email me up, you know, to you transportation. Um, yeah. And it's only about two miles, so it's close enough that you can ride your bike or right. whatever. <laughs> Oh yeah, you could like then just if you can't make this field day, then those are big tape. Maybe we can go to the It's gonna still be kind of like sign up type thing. So regardless of whether you can go to the first field day, the second one is still gonna be open for anybody who wants to go. There's still gonna be a sign up, but it's not gonna be true. And the second one will be on the roof of the FedEx building installing hives. So um and you will need PPEs for that one. There's gonna be lots of bees flying around everywhere. Yeah. So, all right, so last week we, we talked about everything sort of from a bee perspective, and now we're gonna talk about it from a honey, a beekeeper perspective. So before we delve in, I want you guys to close your eyes again and picture the inside of a beehive, right? You're in the hive, there are all these smells, there are all these bees brushing up against you, there's complete and utter darkness, right? That's your life. Suddenly, like there's this bright light, there's all this noise, and there's a beekeeper leaning over you, right? So when you go into a hive, you kind of have to start with that perspective that when you're looking down into the hive, the bees, it's basically like you pulled the roof off of your house. So if you were in your house, you know, going up about your day, someone ripped the roof off and looked down on you, you might be slightly in the way, right? So now we're gonna change our viewpoint and look down into the hive. So the role of the beekeeper is to understand the biology and sociology of the honeybee and then to utilize that knowledge to achieve their personal goals. So as a beekeeper, you have to know what your goals are. And mostly people are like, well, I just want to have bees for my plants or I just want honey. But even that, you're making definitive choices about how many bees you're going to keep, how much time you're going to spend, how many times you're going to split your hive, if you're going to move your hive. All of these questions are going to affect how you keep your bees. And if you put three beekeepers in a room and you ask them any question about beekeeping, you will probably end up with seven answers, all of which are probably correct, right? It's, there's lots of ways to skin a cat and there's lots of ways to keep a bee. And people will debate about it and you can be around expert beekeepers and they will still argue about different things. Everybody has their own perspectives. And there's science underlying it, but there's also an art piece to it. So if you're a beekeeper, these are some of your goals. Pollination, which if you wanna make money as a beekeeper, this is where you're gonna actually make money. You get paid, used to be $50 per hive per crop. I think it's probably gone up. I think it's over 200 for almonds. For almonds, yeah, almonds are, are that's a that's a whole other thing to take your bees out to California. That's like a big deal. But around here, you can still get paid to pollinate crops, and usually 
you know, blueberries, apples up in the mountains. Um, lots of people go out and do cucumbers and um, squash and zucchini and stuff out through the West. We've been paid to uh, uh, try to pollinate uh, strawberries being grown in uh, greenhouses, which strawberries out in the open in an open field don't really need a lot of pollination, but in greenhouses they do. So you never know. Um, there's a lot of, um, that's it. Like as a beekeeper, you're really not gonna make money um, unless you start out with a lot of money <laughs> and, <laughs> and then, you know, uh, spend it all and then maybe you'll make a little bit. But uh, if you were gonna make money, it'd be through pollination. Uh, obviously honey production. Honey production is a big thing for me. I like making honey. I like giving honey to my family. I sell a little honey on the sides. Um, gives you a little pocket money. The money I make on honey in no way offsets the money I spend on bee equipment, but um, um, but it's super fun and lovely. And it's lovely to have honey from your bees. So um, I know a couple that have a really successful beekeeping business and um, all they do, they go to fairs and um, different events and they sell products from the hive. So they'll sell honey when they have honey, but they also make soaps with beeswax in it. They make candles, they make hand creams. They have their own sort of logo. They have a website, they sell online. And so they're really looking at all of those different products of the hive. And then there are lots of people who make money uh, rearing queens and also um, making packages. Now, most of the package operations are in Georgia. They're looking to get those packages out to the beekeepers early in the year, so they need to be in a warmer place. And, um, and they're amazing. They're insane numbers of bees because the package has three pounds of bees in it. So they're pulling hives apart and shaking bees into these packages by the thousands. It's a, it's a crazy, crazy operation. But around here, there are people who rear queens. And if you can rear really healthy queens, um, you can get a lot of money for your queens. So, but it's a complex operation, requires a lot of detailed knowledge about beekeeping. So this is more about pollination services. You can see this is my old trailer. We're, um, moving hives from one um, site to another. So this is a lovely thing. If you're, if you're pollinating and you have to move hives, you strap them down with um, ratchet straps, put them on a hand cart, hope they don't tip over, which they do sometimes. <laughs> um, but it's a lot of fun. So this is a list. We kind of talked about almonds a little bit. Almonds are only pollinated by honeybees. Almonds are a huge monoculture crop. And you're talking about trees. So you're talking about acres and acres and acres where the only thing there are almond trees. So there's no ground cover. There's nothing else for native pollinators to live on. So bees have to be brought in by the thousands. Almonds without good pollination don't really produce any crop. So if you take your bees to California and people take tractor trailer trucks of bees to California, get paid $200 a pop or $300 a pop per hive, they might have a thousand hives that they're transporting. Of course, they have to go through, cross the state line which is very restrictive because California doesn't want you to bring in anything bad into their state. And you have to feed your bees so that they're ready when the almonds bloom. So you've got to get your bees through the winter. So most of those people keep their bees in Florida over the summer where there's plenty of nectar sources, put them on the truck. They usually make like a big loop across the United States. So cranberries in the Northeast, apples, blueberries, we've already talked about, citrus crops in Florida, cucumbers and all the things that are sort of similar to cucumbers around here. 
lots of crops need pollination. These are just kind of the big ones that you're going to make money on. So we're going to talk about management. So the first thing you need to learn how to do, and I think on the field day, you guys can start to think about how this process happens, is you've got to go into your hive, which we already talked about, right? You open up the hive, you have 50,000 bees that are not happy to see you, right? And you have these frames that are covered in honeybees. You have to pull those frames out and you have to look at them. And the things you're looking for is you're looking for a good queen. You wanna make sure that she's there and she's viable, meaning that she is laying eggs. So you don't really necessarily have to see the queen, but you definitely have to see the eggs. Eggs are very, very tiny, very hard to see. You wanna see lots of legs, you, eggs. You wanna see a good laying pattern, the way the queen's laying the eggs. You wanna see larva, you wanna see cat brood. You wanna make sure the hive has plenty of stores to get through the winter. So you're gonna be looking for honey and pollen in the hive. So there's the queen. These are some uh, black plastic frames and um, a beekeeper up in Person County took these pictures. So they're nicely drawn out with really white wax and you can even sort of see an egg down in the bottom. But I want you guys to really look at the queen, right? Because being able to spot her is gonna be critical to your beekeeping. See how the other bee's wings go almost to the end of the abdomen and her wings stop halfway up her back. When you're looking in the hive, you're gonna be like, where is she, where is she? But that's a great marker right there. She's also not gonna move across the frames in the way the other bees move because she's going from cell to cell to see if she can put an egg in each of those cells. So she moves in this very kind of erratic but intentional manner Whereas the other bees are kind of traveling this way or that way or that way, they're moving in a straight line. She's kind of zigzagging. It's a very different, once you watch a queen, you'll start to see the movement's really different, it makes it easier to spot her. There are the eggs. Okay, how many people think if they're holding a frame of bees with 300 bees on the surface up to their face, maybe with a veil on that they're gonna see those eggs. I think you can do it. Walter can do it. <laughs> Adrian can do it. It's very hard. You really wanna tip the frames so that the light hits them. They're very hard to spot. I mean, they're really, you know, think about how tiny they are, but you need to be able to spot those eggs to know that your queen's okay. So here's a picture that includes larval bees, which I think we saw this picture, a similar one last time, and cap root. And you can see how nicely the caps have a little bit of a bulge in them. They're just a little bit up higher. They're kind of a creamy color. Looks very different than cap honey looks. And you can see how healthy the larva looks, right? Beautiful, it's shiny, it's white. And you've got larval bees that you can tell are just about to be capped and already capped brood right next to each other, which means the queen is laying kind of consistently in every cell, which is what we want to see her doing. There's a picture of stored pollen. There's the capped honey. We think we saw, have we seen this? This is an up from another slide show. Um, those are two different kinds of honey. You're looking at uh, tulip poplar on the top and uh, blueberry on the bottom. And look at how far out to the edges it's drawn. The wax comb is completely drawn out and the honey is from wall to wall. That's a beautiful frame. That's, that's what you're looking for when you're harvesting honey. Okay, so say you go in your hive, you see all of those things. You say, this is a strong hive. They've got lots of bees, the queen's laying great, there's lots of larva. They've got plenty of food, plenty of stores. So what do you do as a beekeeper? So one thing you could do is make more room. 
Like you might be a little worried that this hive, if it's really going to town, that it might want to swarm. So you want to make sure that there's plenty of room for the queen to lay. You want it to put on extra supers if they're bringing in nectar. So there's plenty of room for any excess honey. If they don't have room to put honey, they're going to um, slow down. So you want them to have plenty of space when the flow is on to put as much honey in as they want to. And then if it's really bulging at the seams and you're very worried about swarming, you might divide the colony and split it. And we'll talk a little bit more about this now, but this is kind of more advanced beekeeping. So anytime you lose a queen or you move a queen, your hive can make another queen. All she needs, all that the workers need are fresh eggs. So if you have eggs that are one to three days old, the workers will draw out queen cells and they'll put those eggs in there and then they'll give that bee extra food and extra attention and that will become the queen, right? So the only difference, we talked about this last time in the biology, is the rearing of the queen, right? The queen emerges from the same egg as the worker bee emerges from. Does that make sense? It's just nutrition is the difference. Yes. Do you think you could do like a brief explanation of like what adding a super is? Oh yeah, yeah. And we're gonna look at, at the boxes and how you do that. But, but each box, you can have a 10 frame or an eight frame um, box for your bees. And in this picture, I'm holding up one frame, right? It's double-sided. So the bees are drawing it out just like they would if it was in a, a tree, but we've provided them like a format. So that way we can pop that frame out and we can look at both sides and see what's going on on it. And those are called movable frames. And this came about in like the 1880s. Before that, people kept bees in skeps, they kept them in logs, they kept them in, um, in Egypt in like these ceramic cylinders, but to harvest the honey, you basically had to destroy the hive. So when the Reverend Langstroth, who's a famous beekeeper, came up with these movable frames, it like totally changed the way we beekeep because now we can pull the frames out, we can examine the hive for trouble, and we can also remove the frames, take the honey out, and give the frames back to the bees without having to kill the bees. I heard a man up in Person County tell a story about how when he was a kid, um, he would go help his mom in the beehive and they would burn the hive with sulfur and basically melt everything inside the hive, kill all the bees, and then take the honey and strain the honey out. So that used to be the way that, you know, if you collected honey, you were pretty much killing the bees to do it. So this way you can keep your bees alive and you can harvest honey. So, so I kind of got off the subject of queen rearing, but does that make sense? The queen is a fertilized egg, just like a female worker bee. The only difference is she's raised in a queen cell, which is larger, and she's given royal jelly, and her development takes longer than a worker bee. Yes. So then how do like the workers like decide which one's going to become the queen? They don't, they don't decide. They just randomly take eggs. I mean, I'm sure that they have some kind of judgment about which eggs they take, but all they really need to make a queen is an egg that's less than three days old. But the reason they decide to make a queen is based on that pheromone we were talking about. So the queen pheromone, if that drops down in the hive, either because you smushed your queen, your queen absconded, she didn't make it back from her mating flight, whatever happened, you don't have a queen, she's not producing queen pheromone, the worker bees, the first thing they'll do is they'll start drawing out queen cells. Like as soon as they're the least bit concerned, they'll do that. 
And then they'll, you know, sometimes you'll go in a hive and you'll see a lot of emergency queen cells, um, but no eggs in it. It's just like they're being prepared just in case. And then if they're really sure she's gone, they'll try to make a new queen. If they can't make a new queen and it goes too long without that pheromone, then they will start thinking they need to start laying eggs. But we talked about that before. They can only lay an unmated egg, right? They have no sperm. They have no male information. So all of their eggs are going to be haploid, which will all be drones. And uh, when you open up a box that's been, um, that has laying workers in it, all these drone bees will fly up in your face. And it makes a strange sound. Like it's much louder than a regular beehive. And you're just like, oh my. But at that point, it's gone. No coming back if, if you open it up and there's a ton of drones. So let's see. So the other thing that happens is if the queen is failing or the hive is so big that there's not enough queen pheromone to fill the hive, there's so many bees in the hive that pheromone cannot spread throughout the hive. What'll happen is they'll decide that they need to swarm. They need to divide. So you're not choosing to divide them. They're choosing to divide themselves. And so what you see here on the lower bottom is a swarm cell. And there's actually another little partial one next to it. So on the bottoms of the frame, they'll draw out these drop cells like this. And that means usually if you see a swarm cell, it's too late. Your hive is already going to swarm. But if you see these early enough, you can go ahead and divide the hive and get ahead of them. But what they're going to do is the same thing they would do with an emergency cell is they're going to put eggs in it. They're going to feed it royal jelly. It's going to turn into queens. And then once the queens emerge, usually the first queen out of the hive kills all the other queens. So sometimes there are fights. Usually she'll kill them before they emerge. But um, sometimes there are fights. There's some work being done on whether or not the bees have a favorite. Like if all the queens are emerging, you know, there are two or three that emerge at the same time. There's some theory that the older worker bees kind of are favoring one queen over another. So you'll notice on these capped brood cells right above that swarm cell, they're kind of bumped up. Do you see how they have like, some are really flat and some have a little ridge on them. They're kind of humped. Those are drone cells. And I think we'll see more pictures of drone cells later on, but you'll be able to tell them really clearly. And usually about 10% of your hive, except during the middle of the winter, will be uh, drone bees. And everybody remembers you have worker bees, you have drone bees, and you have the queen. Right. All right. So there's your swarm cell. All right, here's a picture of a swarm. So if a beekeeper fails to keep up with a hive that's crowded, the bees will create that swarm cell. The old queen, they, they put her on a diet and then she and the forager bees will leave. And they'll fly to what they call a bivouac, which is like just a temporary resting place. Usually it's someplace awkward for the beekeeper. In this case, it's in a privet bush where you can't get underneath the bush. You can't shake it out. The bees are all there. You have to put down like a drop cloth and try to shake them all onto the drop cloth or find the queen in the midst of that. Very gentle in the swarm. And I have you a swarm video, but I think it's, it's in a different talk. So we'll get to see, Walter sent it to me, we'll get to see a great video of the bees actually swarming out of the hive, which is way fun to watch, but unless you can catch that swarm, it's like, you don't want to see it. <laughs> You're going to see it, but you don't always want to see it. Okay, the reverse of this problem is if you go in your colony and you don't see any of those things, right? You don't see the beautiful cells, you don't see the 
the mass of egg laying. You don't see the nice pattern of the laying. You don't see a lot of larva. You see weak stores. There's not a lot of honey stored. There's not a lot of pollen. So what are you going to do about that? Well, the first thing to do is give them some food. Like as soon as you can, mix up some sugar water, put a feeder on it, get some food to them. Reduce the entrance to your hive because if you've got a weak hive and a strong hive, your strong hive in an hour, I've seen it happen in under an hour, they will come into that hive, they will take everything out of it, clear it out, you'll go in, there'll be nothing. I've seen a hive that was dying out slowly on someone else's property. They called me, they said, it's full of honey, but it's, it's failing. Can we harvest the honey? And I'm like, yeah, let's get the honey out of there. By the time I got to their house, the other bees had come in, they taken every bit of honey and they were gone. So you wanna like put an entrance reducer and you're gonna look at those at the field day and um, stop those bees from robbing. So then you gotta figure out why is this hive weak? So you wanna test for pests and diseases, especially varroa mites. So if you can, you're gonna to wanna to do a sugar shake test to see what your varroa mite load is. And we're gonna talk about all of that during our pest and disease talk. One of the things you can do really quickly is if you've got this strong hive, you can go over to that hive, shake the bees off of the frames and add be like add a couple frames that have larva and eggs in it, add a couple frames that have honey in it, and you can just move them back and forth. As long as you're not moving bees, you can move frames that have material in them. Does that make sense? If you're you have a really weak hive and you want to combine it with a stronger hive, and you want to combine all the worker bees, you can't just move the worker bees over because these worker bees are attached to this queen and they're used to that smell. And these worker bees are attached to this frame and that smell, right? And so what you wanna do is put a newspaper between them and do what we call a newspaper combine. And then by the time they chew through the newspaper, it's like two cats under a door, they'll get used to the smell of the new hive and they'll be okay. But you can easily move a frame once you shake the bees off of it, a whole frame of brood, a whole frame of honey. If you think the hive is worth saving and just needs a little extra help, that's an easy way to rebalance your hives. So it's always good to have at least two hives. I recommend new beekeepers when they're starting out to start with two hives because one will invariably be stronger and one will be weaker. And this allows you to utilize those materials back and forth and also to see the difference to be able to compare them. So we're gonna talk in depth about all of this stuff, but these are the things facing bees right now. So number one, the varroa mites. And we're gonna spend a lot of time talking about the varroa mites. And I think I said last time, they came over to the United States in the 1980s they jumped from the Asian bee to the um, Apis mellifera. And in the Asian bee, they only affect the drones. So they're not a problem. They, they live together harmoniously. But here, they just, um, they go in all the cells, they weaken all the bees. So they're the biggest problem. So all of our hives, I don't know anyone that has a hive that doesn't have some varroa mites. Now the question is, can you keep your varroa mites at a level that's low enough that they're not destroying the hive? So varroa mites, then nutrition and forage, and obviously development, lawns, monoculture, humans, were all detrimental to bee forage. And climate change is even more because erratic weather is plays havoc on plant bloom times and the amount of nectar that's produced. So cumulative pesticide and miticide buildup in the wax of the beehives. We talked about this briefly last time, but most of what we find in beeswax when we test it for pesticides 
are the miticides that we ourselves as beekeepers have been treating the varroa mites with, right? So, so we're trying to keep that threshold down and we're using these pesticides and then the pesticides get into the wax and they build up and build up and build up. And then what happens is inside the wax, they'll react with other pesticides that the bees pick up and bring in. And those things can have cumulative effects that are really negative for the bees. And this is different than, you know, there are things that we use in farming that if you spray them on the field and the bees are on the field, the bees are all gonna die immediately. This is more like, it just makes them sicker and weaker. It's a very slow process. So it's harder to test for. The EPA now does like long-term two to five year studies of hives where they expose bees to a pesticide and then they monitor the number of bees on a frame and they monitor the amount of honey the bees bring in. They follow all of that over a long period of time to determine how harmful the pesticide is. So poorly bred queens, we talked a little bit about the genetic bottleneck in the United States. And then there's just some general diseases and other pests that have always affected bees. Um, some of which, because we're treating for varroa mites, have actually kind of disappeared because we're treating our bees regularly for varroa mites and we're knocking those pests out at the same time. Okay, there's a varroa mite. So we'll look more at this, but it's basically like a tick. But if you think about the size of the honeybee, and if that was a tick on you, it would be a tick that was this big, right? So just imagine you have this tick attached to you that's like sucking the nutrients out of your fat cells continuously. And then jumping in to the cells with your larva and doing that while they're trying to develop. So this is the bad guy. And, um, we really have to be on our guard. Like a lot of times when you see hives fail, you might say they're failing because of this or that or whatever you see in the hive, but they're probably failing because the varroa mites have weakened them to the point that made them susceptible to other problems. Okay, weak stores we talked about. Um, some people feed their bees pollen. In North Carolina, it's rare that we have a shortage of pollen. If you're, you know, if you're going to do a lot of pollination early in spring, you might feed them some pollen. You have to be careful. Um, since there's so much pollen around, if you feed them pollen and you leave it in the hive, it's going to attract hive beetles and it can cause other problems. But definitely sugar water. You're going to need, there's going to be moments where you're going to need to feed your bees uh, sugar water. So here's an example of what happens when the workers start laying. The workers can't, you know, their abdomens are really short. So there's a worker laying right there, but she can't get her abdomen all the way down to the bottom of the cell. So she can't place one egg perfectly centered the way the queen will. So what you'll see is you'll see a whole bunch of eggs in the bottom of the cells. Can everybody see that? And that you don't wanna see. But it doesn't happen that often. And there's lots of things you can do before you get to this point. All right, this is a disease frame. I think it might be American foul brood, but you don't need to know what the disease is to know that when you look at this, there is something really wrong, right? You can see how um, the tops, the cap cells have been partially opened up, probably because the bees knew there was something wrong. You can see like the, um, the bottoms of the cells kind of have gook in them. There's nothing healthy or alive in there. So here again, this is something that you really don't wanna see. But in North Carolina, happily, we have the best uh, apiary inspectors in the country. And we have six, seven, eight. We have eight, I should know this, my ex-husband is one. Um, 
they are great. Most states, South Carolina has one apiary inspector. We part have time, eight part time. part time. Yeah, part time. He can't, he's not even doing it full time. So we have inspectors all over the area. Um, Don is uh, our inspector around here. And you can go to the North Carolina Beekeepers Association site and you can find out the name of the nearest inspector and you can call them and um, they will come out, look at your hives. If they can tell you what's going on, advise you what to do. They're really great. They'll talk to you over the phone. They have trucks with all beekeeping equipment in it and they are, they are on the road all the time going from hive to hive. Just great, great people doing really great work, incredible beekeepers. So if you saw this in your hive, that would be what I would recommend you do. Like you might be able to determine that it's American fell brood, but really getting an inspector out to look at it is great. And Don came out and um, met with the bee club early on and uh, inspected all the hives. It was great. And maybe we can invite him back. Okay, so we're finally gonna talk about the boxes, right? So this is, um, I just pulled this from the internet, but it's showing you the difference between the different boxes. So you've got the entrance at the bottom that the bees come in and out of. On the right, you have two deep boxes, one on top of each other. Now, most people, and it people really vary how they do things, they're gonna use two deeps and then they're gonna put a narrower super on the top. And for some obscure reason, there are some, there are supers and then there are what we call mediums. And a medium is just slightly deeper than a super. And I always use mediums as my super. It can get very confusing. And there can, if you don't have equipment that all matches up, that can get very confusing because you go to grab a box. If you have, I used to have eight and 10 frame boxes. You go to grab a box and it's the wrong size for whatever hive you're working on. So what this is showing you right here is the B stands for brood. And that's really where you want the queen. You want her down in your deep boxes and you want her to make this nice ball of brood in the center. The H's stand for honey super. And you can see as the spring comes on, they come through the winter. Hopefully you have this wonderful mass of brood. You put a honey super on top, that honey super fills up and becomes just honey. And then you put another honey super on top of that. Now that's kind of an ideal movement through the spring in terms of what you're doing as you're managing your, your bee boxes. So these are packages and this is what we're gonna see in the second field day. We're gonna get two of these packages. These are ones stacked all on top of each other. It's just a little box with screen in it. it has three pounds of bees, a queen in a little queen cage, and a jar of sugar water in the center that has little holes cut in it that the bees are feeding on. So the other thing you could do was get a nuke, which is just like a very small bee box. And they're very hard to find and they're kind of expensive, but a nuke will start you out in the spring with a lot more strength than say a package, because a package is just a random assortment of worker bees that have been shaken from different hives into that little box and then shipped from Georgia to here. So they're stressed out, they're tired, they're hungry. They're not associated with the queen. The queen that's in there has nothing to do with them. They don't know her, she doesn't know them. So, all right, so we're gonna look back at these hives a little bit more and I'm gonna walk over here because that's too far. Okay, so this hive has a hive stand with a landing board. Not all hives have hive stands, um, but this is nice. It allows the bees to land when they're coming in. This is your bottom board. It basically has edges to it and a landing spot. This is the entrance reducer that I mentioned. You guys are gonna see all of this at the field day. 
for a bottom board, I like a screen bottom board. So instead of it being a solid piece of wood, it has a piece of screen in the bottom. That means any debris from the hive can fall out of the hive. And if there's any moisture, if rain or something gets in, it will also fall out of the hive. Because keeping the hive dry is going to allow the bees to keep it warm. If the hive gets damp inside, it gets a lot harder for the bees to maintain their temperature. So this is your deep box. They're calling it a super. I've never heard anybody call it that. They usually call it a deep. And then you have your eight or 10 frames, right? And there's your shallow. You have an inner cover. Some people use inner covers. Some people don't. This is uh, helps with ventilation. And then you have your complete cover. And that's one that wraps all the way around. If you're transporting bees, you'll have like a transport cover that won't have two sides on it. And then this is a queen excluder, which some people use and some people don't. The goal of the queen excluder is if you're trying to collect honey, you don't want the queen laying eggs where you're collecting honey. So does that sort of make sense? Okay. And like I said, this on the field day, you're going to see all of this in person, get your hands on it, and that will be helpful. So the great thing about Reverend Langstra is that this is what he created. And so it's wonderful. So if you have a small number of bees, you can reduce the size of the hive. If you have a large number of bees, you can increase the size of the hive. If you need frames from this hive, you can pull those frames out, put empty frames back in. It allows this movability that as a beekeeper allows you to do a lot of things that earlier beekeepers could not do. All right, so we already sort of talked about this, but this is one of the things you need to think about in the spring is creating more room. So adding more supers to the top so that you don't have swarming. And here's the swarm that I collected off my cedar tree. I just cut it off, shook it into the bucket. Then I carried the bucket over to my hives, put a new hive set up in it, and dumped those bees back into the new hive. It's usually not that easy. This looks like a pretty small hive too. It probably, a small swarm, probably didn't do very much. You can tell I caught the queen though. The bees on the lower rim are all um, fanning. They have their tails up in their air and they're waving their wings and they're sending out a home pheromone, which says, this is where the queen is, everybody come here. So any bees that I didn't catch, which I didn't catch a lot of bees when I shook this out of the tree, um, will smell that smell and know where to go. Okay, so this is the slide we saw before. So that's kind of spring into summer. Now, these are my hives looking fairly messy. And, uh, you know, at one time they were all painted matching colors, but now they're just sort of random. Um, so I think in this picture we are putting in, we're getting ready for fall and we're putting in those entrance reducers over the front of the hive. The other thing that you want to prevent with the entrance reducers is in the wintertime, mice will come and live in your hive. So you want to get that entrance reducer on there before they, the temperature really drops because the mice will find their way into a little dark corner of your hive and then you will find a little encapsulated um, mouse carcass um, later on, which is not something you really want to see. All right, so this is beautiful. This is what you want to see. Normally you wouldn't want to open up your hive like this in the winter time, but this is just to show you what it should look like. So we've got two deeps and we've got a nice cluster of bees. So we talked last time about how the bees form a nice ball in the winter time to keep warm, right? And just like the penguins, there are bees on the outside that are very, very cold and they go to the inside and other bees go to the outside and they all unclip their wings and fan. And inside that ball, it's like 95 degrees. Is that not impressive? They can vibrate so much, they can produce this ball of heat. And that ball is over frames that hopefully have good honey stores in them. 
And in the winter time, if everything goes well, the cluster will slowly move up in the hive. So it starts out down here where it's all around the brood and then it moves up into the honey stores. And hopefully by the time spring comes, you won't have run out of honey. So it's beautiful. So this is kind of showing you in the first picture, we're in the late winter. The brood has moved up into the second box. There's a little bit of honey around it. So once we get out of winter, we want that queen back in that lower box, right? So as soon as it's, we know it's not gonna freeze again and that we're not gonna disrupt the bees too much, we'll switch the top box for the bottom box. Then as we move into the springtime, the brood will expand. They'll again be putting honey at the top. Now the last picture, <laughs> They flipped it again, and I've never seen anyone do that. I don't know why. I don't know I why. Don't you... mind at all, so. Yeah, lots of people don't. And the queen will go down because she'll run out of places to lay. Um, the goal is once she's up at the top, if you're worried about her, and some queens have a tendency to only want to go up, if she's one of those queens, sometimes it's good to put her back in the bottom. But you definitely don't want to do this if it's cold because then you're breaking up the bees. You're taking them away from where the honey source is. But this just shows you an example of how you can manipulate the hive to improve your beekeeping. And there are things that you can do too with the frames to encourage the bees to go up into the supers, to start drawing out comb, to start laying honey. And then you know, another aspect of this is, this is you saying, I'm the beekeeper, I know what I'm doing, I'm going to make the bees do this. But the bees in general know what they're doing. So most of the time, you don't need to, you know, you need to be aware that this is possible. But most of the time, if you let the bees do what they're going to do, the bees know better than you. I'm looking at Walter. Walter's like, the bees know. Oh, uh, that's, that's why I have my sleeping girl. <laughs> the, bees, the bees really do know. And, um, and there are beekeepers who are really, really hands-on who will do all of this manipulation. And there are beekeepers who will do very little of it. And there are lazy beekeepers like me who don't do it. We think we maybe ought to do it, but we just can't seem to get out to the beehive to do it. So... There we go. And the bees, you know, continue to survive. So harvest, here we go with the fun part, right? You've kept your bees alive for the first year. You've had a really good nectar flow in the spring and then you get to harvest honey. So here's some honey uh, from a, a getting bees out of a tree. Beautiful, just pours out everywhere. So the first thing is honey is extremely messy. Walter has a honey house. I don't have a honey house, I have a kitchen. What happens is every time I harvest honey in my kitchen, there is honey everywhere. I say, I put down plastic, I keep the dogs out. I do everything I can, but the honey goes everywhere. And then you're like finding it on the walls and on the top of your refrigerator. You're like, how did I get honey there? The other thing is it gets all over you while you're working. So you're like licking honey off yourself. And then by the time you get done, you think I never want to eat honey again. But so very messy. So the first thing you do is you get the bees to leave the supers. Like you go out and check your hive. You say, oh, I've got six supers that have good capped honey in it. You want the honey that's all the way capped. You want them to have taken as much moisture out of it as they can so that it won't ferment. And then you convince the bees to go out of those frames. And people do it different ways. Some people brush the bees off. I use uh, Bee Quick. What's the other one? Uh, honey Bee Go. Honey Bee Go. I think, I think Honey Bee Go is the one I don't like. I think Be Quick 
Anyway, it's a, you put it on a piece of felt on the top of the hive on a warm day, and the smell is something the bees don't like. So they, it drives them down into the lower frames. Then you can take the super off with very few bees in it, take it quickly inside. Because if you take a super off and you just set it somewhere, the bees will find it and that'll be it. No more honey. So you wanna make sure the queen is not up there. So maybe if you had a queen that likes to go up, you've put in a queen excluder to make sure she's in the lower hives. You've got your cat honey. You've got this nice box of it. It's 40 pounds. You need to have a friend with a really good back, you know, because you got to lift that thing off and it's just, it weighs a ton, but it's great. It means you have lots of honey. So you get the bees out, you remove the supers, you bring them in, you try to prevent honey from going everywhere, and then you need to cap, cut off the capping's wax, right? You need to expose all of that um, honey underneath so it can come out of the frames because the bees have carefully stored it. They put lids on all their jars. So you got to cut that um, uh, capping's wax off the top. This is a heat knife. So it gets hot, so it melts the wax off so you can slowly draw it over the frame. I've burned up uh, two uh, of these knives, so I don't use them anymore. <laughs> I just use a serrated, a really sharp serrated knife. You can also use a capping scratcher, which has like little teeth in it to open up the cells. And then you put them in an extractor. And depending on the extractor, this is the one that belongs to the Orange County Beekeepers Association. And if you're a member, you can rent it, I think for $5 a day, it's something extremely cheap. Um, well worth the price. You just have to compete with the other beekeepers for when it's available. And so the frames sit in it like this. It's a centrifuge. And so what happens is as you spin it, it swirls around and all the honey's thrown to the side, right? So you want to like, you want all the honey to come out of the frames and then it drips down. And then I usually have a nice clean five gallon bucket with a paint strainer in it. And I filter the honey going into my five gallon bucket. Once it's uh, in a five gallon bucket, you need to let it sit like 24 hours to kind of settle out. And then you can start bottling your honey. So um, there are lots of different kinds of honey um, and lots of ways to make honey. So as a beekeeper, that's the most simple is to just take the supers, draw out the honey and, um, and sell that or use that. But people also make comb honey where they cut sections of the comb out and put those inside the bottles. That's really in demand. Chunk honey or section honey will also have the wax in them. And then um, cream honeys are honeys where they've been, um, it's like you heat them to, a, I never made cream honey, but you heat them to a certain temperature and you stir them, do you whip them? You heat it to 150 degrees, which melts any existing crystals in it. Mm -hmm. And then you mix in seed crystals. It's basically just cream honey that you already made before. Mm -hmm. And those seed crystals are real, real fine crystals. And they'll make that whole jar crystallize on the same pattern as the seed crystals are. So you wind up with real, real fine crystallized honey. Uh, you got to let it sit for like a week in a refrigerator because 55 degrees is the perfect temperature for it to crystallize. But you'll wind up with honey that's like the texture of an icy. That's the closest thing I can think of, but it's, it's real, real fine crystals. Um, so, so maybe maybe the next class where we meet in person, maybe I, I could bring some of my uh, regular honey. Maybe you could bring a little sample of your cream honey. All right. I got some chocolate cream honey. All uh, right. <laughs> excellent, excellent. I'm so sorry for the people on Zoom, <laughs> but there you go. Um, 
So pollen um, is another thing that we collect from the hive. Lots of people use pollen uh, to, for preventing allergies. Eating honey that is harvested, that, that the bees collected from plants, it has some of the plants in it that you're allergic to will help with your allergies because you're getting minute portions of the pollen from that plant. So it's kind of like getting an allergy shot in a very small dose every day so your body adapts to it. So, um, and, and pollen, you know, lots of different people use pollen. So uh, you can put a pollen trap on the front of your hive that when your bees are walking into the hive, they have to go through a narrow entrance and that uh, drops the pollen off of their legs and then it drops into a collection plate. But you don't wanna keep it on all the time because the bees need their pollen. So you just wanna put it on for a little while, collect the pollen. And usually you have to store pollen in your freezer. It can get mildewy really quickly. Propolis, we talked about the bees using propolis to stick all of the hives together. And so um, lots of people use this medicinally because it's antimicrobial. And so you can see here we are with a hive tool, we're scraping it off the side of a frame. And in certain countries, people are really into propolis and where they are, they use like a plastic board that the bees fill in. You put it in the freezer, it's coated with propolis. When it freezes, you just crack that board and all the little pieces come off. So you can definitely, you know, you can harvest enough with your hive tool easily, but if you, um, if you were going to harvest it for sale or for processing, um, you might want to use that other system. And beeswax. So we talked about the cappings wax, which we use for um, any kind of um, lip balm or hand cream or something like that. The old beeswax, like if you have a frame that breaks or the wax is getting old or you're just messing in the hive and pieces, the bees have grown things, they've drawn out the comb in a weird way, you're always getting pieces of beeswax. So a solar wax melter is great. There are lots of instructions online on how to make one. I have one at home. If you guys wanna borrow it, we could bring it one day and set it up on the rooftop and melt some wax from it. And then um, if you get into making things out of molds, you'll suddenly have like boxes and boxes of um, molds and all sorts of weird oils and scents. And I don't know how much stuff I have uh, <laughs> to do wax making because you kind of, um, you creep into it. And then the next thing you know, you, you uh, spend a lot of money. But it's great and it's great for presents. Like family members love to get things made out of wax, or at least my family members tell me that. I love my candles. I, I give away a bunch of candles, but I also use my beeswax candles and they're just beautiful and smell great. So, and royal jelly. So here is a swarm cell that's been broken open and you can see that creamy white substance. That's the royal jelly that's fed all the bees, all the larval bees get a little bit of it, but the queen is fed pretty exclusively with royal jelly. And there's lots of differing opinions about whether royal jelly is good for you. I will tell you that uh, I've eaten it fresh out of the hive. I really don't think I'll ever do that again, but, um, but many people use it um, um, medicinally. The end. There's one other thing too that's not in your presentation. The, it's, it's, it's pretty new, it's just really getting going in the last couple of years, but there's a pretty good market for bee venom for uh, uh, cosmetics. Yeah, I should have added that because we talked in the last talk a little bit about bee venom, but that's definitely, and I told you guys about the electric plate, right? The electrified plate. I know I started to last talk, I thought I did, but um, the way they collect the bee venom, right? So if the bee stings you, right, it dies. So if you're collecting bee venom, you don't want your bees to die. So they put a plate in front of the hive 
that has electric current in it. So when the bees walk over the glass plate, they get a little electric shock. And when they do, they sting the glass plate. But because it's glass, their stinger doesn't go in and they don't die, but they deposit a little bit of venom on the glass. And at the end of the day, you take the glass off, it's, the venom has all dried on the surface and you scrape it off. And I know that Inga has told me the cost per ounce of bee venom, but it is some outrageous. It's like $200 per microgram or something like that. It is, it's, it's, uh, <laughs> it's worth the work. So, and lots of cosmetics now more and more utilize, um, especially like anti-wrinkle creams and things like that will have it. I think lip plumpers, things that make your lips plumper. It will, makes your skin as well as what, what happens. It's just like a bee sting, except it's, it's more, it's less localized, so. All right, so questions from this week and from last week. Yes. Yeah. How does unhooking their wings work? So they have a little clasp between their double wings. So if they had their wings together and they vibrated their wings, they would fly, right? So they unclasp their wings and then they just vibrate their wings. Right, and, and we talked about that the thorax is all just a big series of muscles that operate those wings. So they just vibrate the wings. And if they're standing, if it's a warm day, and they're on the top of the hive and they're standing over um, some water that they put on the top of the hive, that water will evaporate and the temperature will drop. If they're standing over open nectar or honey that's not ripe yet, it'll evaporate the excess water out of the honey. And if they're in the swarm or in the cluster in the winter time, that vibration will just produce heat. And so that basically, you know, the queen is sort of at the center of the cluster and all the other bees are just doing that vibration to keep that, keep her warm. If there's any brood to keep that brood warm and to keep each other warm. Can they rehook their wings up? Oh yeah, yeah, it's just a little, it's just a little double, like it's a little clasp and it, and it just connects and disconnects. That's so cool. It is, yes, <laughs> everything, I, don't, I think everything about these is pretty cool. So any more questions? Yes. Um, I know there's a lot of debate about um, whether honey can be a part of a vegan diet. What do you think about that? So my sibling is vegan and they eat my honey because they feel like the way that I raise my bees is not harmful to them. Yeah. So I think it depends on why you're being a vegan. For them, it, it has to do with with animal cruelty and, and they don't feel like that I'm harming my bees. Now, some commercial bee operations are pretty, you know, the goal, the goal is more important than the bees. You're still gonna have bees. I mean, it, we were talking earlier about individual bees dying and, and that that's not, you know, the same as the hive dying. And I think you can be very sentimental about bees. And obviously we want bees to survive as a species. And I think that having beekeepers is really important to that at this point in time, especially because of the Varroa mites. So anyway, that's their choice. But, but I know other vegans that don't eat any honey at all. Yeah. I also know like for our club, we harvested honey one time freshman year. It was just because our bees had died until so really late, like across and then freezing rain out, it was horrible. Um, but it just wiped out our entire hive. Um, but there were honey stores. Uh, and so like we did have a meeting where we harvested honey uh, just because like it was left over it was just sitting there. Right, right. Um, so we did have we do have some meetings that are in our club. Um, and like kind of the opinion they gave was along the lines of like, well, in this case, like we don't want it to go to waste. It wasn't anything that was done by us that kind of like caused the bees to die. And then like it's all about how you take care of them. Like that's another point I wanted to ask. Like, 
in terms of when you harvest honey, I know that's very specific, but how do you know if your hive is strong enough and there's enough to harvest? Like, when do you know to stop? Well, it, I think it's that it's that weight ratio, and you're always taking a risk because you're assuming that you're going to have a good fall flow that's going to provide enough honey to get your bees through the winter. But you're also making a commitment to the bees that if there's a dearth, that you're going to feed them. So I don't like to take all the honey from my hive, but if I have two deeps and those have some honey in them um, and the hive is really strong, I don't feel bad about taking all the supers. Now, if, if they've got three supers on the top and they're not all full, like the top super isn't finished, but they've started drawing that one out, I might drop that one back down and then take the two lower ones that they've already put away. Um, you definitely want them to have a full super going into the winter. So, and there are beekeepers who never harvest any honey, you know, they leave it on the bees. So um, I think that's sort of a personal preference, but if you're taking honey, you don't take all the honey and you definitely have to be prepared to feed your bees. Walter, what percentage do you think of honey that you take that you call surplus? My own, just for me, I take all the supers and leave them whatever's in the house. But that pretty much guarantees that I'm going to be feeding them some sugar during the dirt in the middle of summer. Yeah. If you wanted to, you know, my goal is to sell the honey and make some money <laughs> off of it and kind of offset the cost of keep it beef. If you just don't care about the money, um, then you could leave your honey on the hive all summer long, harvest whatever excess is there in the fall, which probably won't be any, mm -hmm. up all that all that honey during the summer. Right. And and then you're probably still gonna have to feed them in the fall because they didn't make enough honey in the spring to last them all year long. Right. Um but that would be a way to to give them more of their own honey. Uh, and then, you know, if there's still a bunch of honey left in the fall, you could leave them like one super and then take whatever else is there to sell it. Yeah. I would rather let them eat sugar syrup because sugar costs, what, 40 cents a pound, 30 cents a pound. Honey is $12 a pound. So I would, I would, I would rather let them have this, this, this sugar. But that's just more of a business philosophy. Right. Um, if, if you just want to raise the bees and you're not selling the honey anyway, let them keep the honey all summer long and just harvest whatever extra in the fall. Because if there's too much there, you're going to have to harvest it. They'll, they'll drown in their own honey if you leave too much on the hive. Yeah, yeah. You can definitely, it doesn't happen very often, but you can honey bound a hive where there's no room for the queen to lay because they filled up every available space with honey. And then the queen is looking for open cells to lay in. So it doesn't happen very often, but it's something that can happen. Yeah, so, if you're gonna let them keep all the honey, you have to have a lot of equipment available to be sure that you have plenty of empty, empty super to put on that hive. Because sometimes you might need six or seven supers on a really good year, you might need six or seven supers and they'll fill all of them up. Yeah, in a good in a good year, it's amazing how much honey they can make. And in the fall, they can make it. If we don't have a drought in the fall and the temperatures aren't too high, we can have a really good fall flow. Um, so they can get plenty of honey for the winter, most years, as long as there's not, something doesn't go awry. So I think we're, are we good? Is everybody good? And so next week we won't meet. I have a training in Raleigh. Uh, we'll be at Walters. Um, the people that have signed up for the list, you'll get the address via email. Adrian, is that? Yeah, and then for anybody who's on Zoom, that email is also gonna come out too. So right now we have like about six people signed up. So there's still six spots who are guaranteed to go if weather is bad. And then there's still, 
uh, available 10 or so spots for uh, people who want to go and go in. And if you don't go in person, you'll be able to watch the video on Zoom. Yes. And then we'll be back in class. Yes. And yeah, and then will be optional at the field day if it's outside. If we are inside, masks are going to be mandatory. Makes perfect sense. Well, hopefully, I'll see some of you guys next Saturday.